There comes a time in our Christian walk where our faith goes public. It's because it's really not our faith, it's the faith of Jesus Christ in our lives. And that faith wants to be demonstrated, it wants to be revealed, and that's exactly what Jesus wants us to do. In this crazy season of our nation and maybe the world, what a better time to share the faith and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Many times when people go public with a new product in the business world, they always do many things to check and make sure it's a quality, uh, it's very quality item. It's got venture capital behind it. People know it's going to sell. People know it's going to benefit other people. Well, You kind of look at that with the faith of Jesus in our lives, amen? We know it's a quality product. We know it sells us because it's changed our lives. We know it can help other people. In fact, let me just quote a scripture to you. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, it says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power of God, the excellence of the power may be of God, and not of us. That the excellence of the power in our lives in going public with our faith may point to God and not to us. Amen? We want to bring people to the revelation of who God is. And the Bible says in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. People are looking for hope today. There's a lot of people without hope. And, you know, I've been praying about these riots, that they would stop. I think it's terrible what's going on. And uh, God created the world to have order. Sin brought disorder. People don't like disorder. People like order. That's the way God created us. And let me tell you, the gospel of Christ is a treasure in your earthen vessel that will bring order to people. It'll bring them hope. And we have to do something. You don't have to be famous to share what Christ has done in your life. You don't have to be a CEO, CFO. You don't have to be rich. You just have to be willing to open your mouth sometimes or to demonstrate with your lifestyle and your actions. And so I'd like to continue the second part of going public with your faith. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're looking at different biblical ways of going public with our faith. It's not just one way, but there are many ways where we can express the faith, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So let's read it. Verse 12 down to 17. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous... Amen. And his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of the threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God Or set apart the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense or an answer to everyone who asks you of the reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Last verse 17. For it is better... If it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Some people suffer for doing evil. Some people suffer for doing good. Let us be the ones who suffer for doing good. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads with me, would you please? Heavenly Father, you in your mercy and grace and great is that mercy, have chosen us to be a part of your family, to forgive us our sins 
and to help us to live a new life. I pray, Lord God, that we would all know that part of that new life is letting that faith of Christ in us come out where other people can see it, other people can hear it, other people, Lord, can respond. Though some may laugh and mock and do us harm, we pray, Lord, that you would lead us to those who are looking for hope, looking for life in Christ. Lord, we pray that our faith would grow so much, Lord, that it would have to come out of our hearts and our mouths and our lifestyles. Help us, Lord, to share the only hope in this troubled world right now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Last week, I let's go to A. Uh, we talked about a few insights on evangelism. We're going to do that, and then we're going to get into ways, different ways of sharing our faith, all right? But a couple more insights on evan evangelism just means telling the good news, telling others what Christ is doing in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your church, whatever it might be. And so uh, last week I told you a couple things. Let's go to number three. Third thing you need to know, next point please, about evangelism is that when you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people, it mainly flows out of relationships, all right? Some people have the courage to go downtown and they can tell people they don't know and just walk up to someone they never met before and say, let me tell you about Jesus. But not most people, not most people. Maybe 10% of the church has that gift of evangelism or they have the office of an evangelism. But most of us, we are a little timid, no one likes to be rejected. No one has the fear of, of being harmed. And so we like to tell people based on relationships. And that's what we're supposed to do. Family relationships. Some of us, most of us, half of our family save, half of them are not saved, all right? Uh, or you may be one of the few that are saved in your family and the rest are not. And those are some relationships that are very key. And so you pray and you wait and you say, God, lead me. For as many that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, Romans chapter 8. And you wait for an opportunity to share that faith, amen? And so most people won't ask the reason of the hope that is in you unless they know you, all right? And so there are people in your sphere of life, in your circle of relationships, I'll never reach. Your spouse may never reach, but you'll reach them. And God put them there for you to say something to them about this hope. And remember, all right, in Africa, it takes three times to share the gospel before people receive Christ. In the United States, it takes 17 times for someone to hear the gospel before they respond. You may be number one or you may be number 17. All right, be faithful and share that. Uh, the second thing. The second thing you need to understand when it comes to going public with your faith, and this is so important, this is why I shared with the children this morning, Jesus died on the cross not just for the forgiveness of sins so you could live any way you want. Jesus died on the cross so that you would live for him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things you want, second will be added unto you. All right. He who is first shall be last. He who is last and puts Christ first shall be first. All right. And so we are Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We're an instrument of God. All right. And you have to see your life as an instrument. I mean, you know, sometimes instruments have to be tuned. Instruments have to be play, placed in certain places that can't be too cold or they go out of tune. They have to be cared for. They have to be uh, restringed. And this is our lives. You're an instrument to be played before people that have not heard the beautiful song of the Lord. And that song of the Lord is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Go to the next scripture, please. The next scripture says, 
Always be ready to give a defense or an answer to everyone who asks you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Why are you so happy? Why is your instrument always cheerful? Why are you always in tune? You're an instrument of Christ. Doesn't mean we're perfect, but we see ourselves to be used. He is the master, like the Stradivarius. We are the Stradivarius. He is the master. We have to be used by him. Amen. So important. And so again, if we say, no, I don't want to do that, uh, we have to question the faith that is in us. God wants to use you. God wants. That's why he says in the, the Lord's Prayer, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Do you know why God wants the glory? Because it's always him. It's always his. And when he uses you to bring glory, he just says, remember, who is the master? Who's playing you? Don't get prideful just because I use you. But remember, who is the master? Amen? Amen. Now let's go on to the second part under B. Uh, let's talk about ways to share our faith. You know, when I was studying for this message, uh, it made me feel so good because sometimes you read through the book of Acts and you, you say, I can't identify with the Apostle Peter and I can't identify with the Apostle uh, Paul or I'm not a John. And yet there are so many different ways, different disciples in the book of Acts that shared their faith in different ways. And you don't have to pretend to be someone else. God made you just the way you are. Your personality, your pains, your past, your present, your future, your gifts, your talents, your strengths, your weaknesses, everything about you God has made for you to be used as an instrument for God to share the hope of Christ. All right? So important that we understand that. So let me first of all do a little review of what we did last week. We'll go to number one. And uh, there are many ways in the book of Acts and in the Gospels, to share our faith. And last week I talked about the confrontational approach. And I said, these are the evangelists. These are the people that have a stronger personality. They kind of get in your face and they know how to share things. A, B, C, boom, boom, boom. And remember Peter on the day of Pentecost? They were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues, and the Jews mocked and said, oh, they're drunk. Peter gets up, quotes from Joel, in the last days, God says, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. This is what's happening. He says they're not drunk. And he started preaching Christ. He didn't know all these people. And he says, you crucified Christ. And the spirit of God used his words and convicted them in their hearts. Some hardened their hearts. Some softened their hearts. And so those that were convicted by God, they said, what shall we do? And he said, Acts 2. 38, repent, be water baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Spirit. And 3,000 were added, all right? So last week I said, how many of you think you have your confrontational approach? Three people put up their hand. <laughs> three people. And I thank God for those three, because every church needs people like that, all right? They'll go reach people that others won't. They'll speak the truth when others will shut down and not say a word because they don't want to get any flack over it. Those are the ones you need. So that's the confrontational approach. But not everyone is a Peter. The second one is the intellectual approach. There's a little bit more of this, I think, in the American church because of the education in this nation. And uh, the United States gives some of the greatest education in the world. So many foreign students come here. And Paul had the greatest mind, some say, in the Western world. And he went to Athens in Acts 17. And he saw all these altars all around. And all these uh, philosophers were talking about this God and this God and this altar and this altar. And Paul ran up and he saw one to the unknown God. And he goes, hey, here's a chance for me to be an instrument to talk about the unknown God who they don't know about, I'm going to say that unknown God is Jesus Christ. So he starts talking about the intellectual approach, starts preaching Christ, starts talking about the resurrection. They go, whoa, wait a minute, what's the resurrection? The resurrection is you're going to judge, you're going to be judging this planet for everything you do when you arose again from the dead. And they're like, what? What? This is some strange stuff. We want to hear more. And Paul was allowed to come back and preach to them again about the resurrection. And some believed. 
some belief. So this is the intellectual approach that some people are a little bit more logical and they're a little bit more educated. They don't want to hear a screaming preacher, but they'll listen to someone who has an argument, A, B, C, D, E, and they'll go, you know what, that makes sense. But still, they have to take a step of faith and receive Christ and admit they're a sinner. It's not all logic. The third approach is what I call the testimonial approach. This is from Jesus in um, John's Gospel, chapter 9, with the blind man. I, I talked about this where Jesus did something really peculiar. God gave him a word of wisdom, how to apply, what to do in a given situation, that if the person obeys it, it links them to the miracle. So the Holy Spirit said, Jesus spit in the dirt, spit in the dirt, make some mud, made some mud, put it in the blind, eye, blind man's eyes, put it in there. And he says, now go tell him to wash in a pool of Siloam, which he can't see. He doesn't know where it is. He has to go find it. How many know sometimes you have to fight for your healing? You have to fight. You have to keep your healing. You can lose your healing. Jesus said to a man at the pool of Bethesda, now go and sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you. You can lose it. So this blind man had to go out and he had to find this pool. I'm sure he asked someone, take me to the pool of Bethesda. Washed his eyes, he could see. Miraculous. He was born blind, beggar. So remember the story, the Pharisees got mad when they found out Jesus did a miracle. And they said, Jesus is a sinner. Jesus is a sinner. And the blind man said, hey, one thing I know. I was once blind. Now I see. <laughs> That's what he said. That's the testimony. Before I met Jesus, I was a mess. Since I met Jesus, let me tell you what he's done in my life. All right? Very important. And so that's the testimonial approach, where you share what Christ has done before you met him or since he's done after. All right? So let's go to the fourth one. We'll do two more today. And we'll wrap it up. The fourth one is what I call the interpersonal approach. It's very similar to the testimony. There's this tax collector named Matthew, and he's also called Levi. And Levi is not a Peter. He's not a Paul. He's, he's not the apostle John. John was someone that would go up and hug everyone anytime, anywhere. I mean, when Jesus was having communion, you know, John put his head on Jesus' breast. And Jesus is trying to break the bread, and he's he just, not everyone is like that, but there are some people like that, all right? And this tax collector, Matthew, who is also known as Levi, he says, I'm not any of them. And Jesus comes walking into his life, and he says, follow me. And he found life outside of what he thought was life, making money. He thought the purpose of life was making money. And Christ came in and changed him. So this guy, Levi, he decides to throw a big party of his friends. Interpersonal is long life friends. Friends you know for at least 20 years or more. All right? Friends that trust you. Very few of us have high school friends. Very few of us still have college friends. But if you got friends 20 years or more, how many of you know that? That's pretty good. That's, you're, you're blessed. And so Levi was a tax collector. He was with the Roman IRS. And he called all his tax friends together and he says, Hey, just come on over. I got a feast. I got the wine. Come on over. I got to tell you something that happened in my life. And so they all come over and they're saying, How are you doing, Levi? He says, I'm doing good. How's the tax business? He says, You know what? I don't, I don't overcharge 20, 30% per, percent anymore. I just charge them the normal rate. And they said, What? How do you make money? I mean, what's wrong with you? And they said, Well, I'm going to tell you in just a second. All right? I'm going to tell you. Something changed my life. I found out in my life, give them a little bit more wine before I tell them this. Give them a little bit more wine. Money isn't everything in my life. What? Now he's talking to his tax collector. Trust, how many know they're the outcasts of society? No one likes them. Go to the verse. He says, I want to tell you. So then Levi gave Jesus a great feast in his house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with him, all his friends, amen? And then he says, 
this is Jesus. Jesus, I'm not good at speaking. Would you tell my friends what you did in my life? That's the interpersonal approach. Those are the ones that say, I can't lead someone to Christ, but I'm going to bring them to church. Here, pastor, lead them to Christ. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay, I can do that. I, it used to frustrate me because it's like, it's not that hard. But Levi's and Matthew's, they have lots of money, but they're very timid. So what they do is they gather a crowd of people and they finance a big party, finance a big thing, and they say there's a house guest here, his name Jesus. Jesus, would you speak? Maybe you identify like that. I'm afraid to open my mouth. I'm afraid. Well, you're the ones that invite people to church. I can't leave them to the Lord in my car. I can't give them the gospel in my house, but I can invite them to church. And after church, I'll bring them down front and I'll have, I'll have Pastor Roger or, or someone pray for them. And then if their heart is open, then I'll say, you lead them to Christ. How many know that's okay? That's okay to do. Because that's what Levi did. And Jesus did not take Levi's testimony. Levi says, I'm giving you time now. You say what you did in my life. Some of us are very timid like that. We're just, we're just not good with words. We just kind of stumble over our own words. But we can invite someone to the church and bring them to the church, and we can bring them down to the altar. And how many know that's good? All right? So the strength about this is that you're, you understand God has given you some friends. Some of them are not even saved. Some of them are atheists. Some of them just believe totally different than you, but they trust you. They trust you. And so you can share with them in this lifestyle evangelism. Now, the only negative thing about this style of interpersonal approach is sooner or later you've got to bring them to church. <laughs> sooner or later you've got to open your mouth. Sooner or later you've got to tell them the reason of the hope that is in you. All right? You just can't just let your light shine and not let your mouth open. You, you have to. And if you say, well, I, I can't share the whole gospel, well, bring them to church and share, have someone help you share it with them. Amen? How many think maybe that's your approach? You're a little bit more comfortable. Put your hand up. All right, a few of you. Yep. Nothing wrong with them. I'll invite them to church. I'll let the Spirit move on them, and then we'll do it. All right, lastly, the fifth one, and we're going to wrap it up. <clears throat> the Dorcas service approach. The Dorcas service approach. This is the approach where people express their faith. They don't want credit. They don't like the limelight. They don't like to be on stage. They express their faith through acts of service. <clears throat> Excuse me for a second. I got a dry tickle. They do it behind the scenes. <clears throat> we have many people in this church that have the Dorcas service of sharing their faith. Dorcas was a woman in the early church that was full of good works. All right? We'll read it. Dorcas was full of good works and charitable deeds, but she became sick and died. And the disciples heard Peter was there imploring him not to delay in coming. They said, hey, this woman does so much for the church that since she died, there's too much of a hole in the church. No one can fill this hole. We need people like this back in the church. Peter, come. Lay your hands. Raise her from the dead. And so Peter came. Let's go to the next verse, please. Peter came. God gave him a word of wisdom. When you're praying for the dead, you have to have complete focus. Put everyone out of the room. Knelt down and prayed. Then, after he prayed and got the mind of Christ... He turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, that name is Dorcas, they have the same name. And she opened her eyes, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many what? Many believed. 
Now, you say, oh, they believe because she was raised from the dead. Yes, miracles obviously bring people to Christ, but it was her life before she died. I hear of a lot of people in our church that will sometimes go and clean homes for some of their family, some of the elder. That is going public with your faith. That is a biblical way of demonstrating your faith to people who don't know Christ. Some people like Habitat for Humanity, where they go build homes for poor people, and they do it because of the motivation of Christ. They don't want to open their mouths. They can't preach. They can't teach. They're kind of interpersonal. I'm not good at sharing my testimony, but I'm good with my hands. I'll go on a missions trip. All right? I'll go on a missions trip. You know, I'll go build a church. I'll go build a school. I'll go to an orphanage. I can do that, and it speaks volumes. It speaks. Pastor Pinella, God has given him a ministry the last couple of years over in Kenya, where he goes and he finds out these needs of these very poor people in Kenya. And uh, there's one ministry there where there's a lot of widows, these women. Their husbands die. What do they do? They have no, they have no education. They have no job. They have no skills. And so the church takes care of them. They don't have welfare over there. And so Pastor Pinella said, you know what, let's raise some finances and let's get something going on a farm and maybe some chickens and, and, and let's do this so we can support. That is a beautiful example of going public with your faith with service, your gifts, acts of serve, charitable deeds that speaks volumes. You know, the church is not about making everyone, you know, a clone of everyone's got to be like Peter, everyone's got to be like Paul, everyone's got to be like the Apostle John. No, there's so much diversity and creativity. God will use you as an instrument if you're just willing to be used. And so Dorcas, everyone knew who she was, and when she died, it was a shock. It was a shock. And Peter was close by. And they said, come over here, raise her from the dead. And the people had faith in how beautiful it was that she was raised from the dead. Now the strength of this one. There's nothing more beautiful than the love of God seen with our actions. Sometimes you just keep loving people, loving people. They don't thank you. They don't acknowledge you. But sooner or later they're going to go, I'm going through a crisis right now and you're one of the few people that are ever kind to me and I need your help. That's the Dorcas service approach. It was your kind deeds behind the scenes that no one saw, but God saw it, and so, so did someone else. And usually it's a crisis that brings them to say, you know, help me out, Elizabeth. Help me out, Ron. And you got to be ready. Now, the strength of that is everyone loves kind people, right? <laughs> everyone likes having people who are giving and kind in their circle of life. All right? The negative thing is that sometimes we substitute our kindness without ever opening our mouths. Again, you've got to open your mouth. You've got to say, I'm doing this. The other day I went to a store, and this, uh, I, I went to a tailor, this tailor in Middlebury, and I've got to be friends with this woman. She's from another country, and she, she, she's done really well. And she really likes me. And so she does some of my coats and other stuff. And, and one day, uh, she said, this one's on the house. This is free. And so I said, okay. I said, here you go. And she goes, what are you doing? I said, this is a tip. And she says, I told you it's on the house. I said, yeah, I'm not paying you. I'm tipping you. And she says, why are you doing that? And I said, I'm blessed by God to be a blessing to you. She looked at me, she said, oh, you're a Christian too. Had to open my mouth. I said, yes, I'm a follower of Christ. But she just didn't want to receive. She said, I'm trying to do something nice for you. I said, I know, that's why I want to tip you. And, and you know, maybe a little cultural difference. But I had a chance to open my mouth. God has blessed me. So I want to pass that on and be a blessing to you. And, and that's what Jesus... So, you know what I'm saying? You can be kind, but you've got to open your mouth sometimes. 
How many of you would identify with Dorcas, the service approach of going public? Nice and high. Look, look at all the hands. God bless you. You're, you're known as people with the gifts of helps. You just love to do things behind the scenes. You don't want to be dragged in the limelight. You don't want to be praised. But God will use it. And the church is really built on people like that. They do so much behind the scenes. And God knows it. Amen. Going public with your faith. We're going we're gonna to end it right there. All right. Let the faith of Christ in you come out. Let it come out. If you're bold enough and you're good with words, it might be, you know, confrontational, intellectual. Maybe it's the testimony. Maybe it's the interpersonal because you've got friends of a long time and you're saying, this person's 80 years old and they just won't receive Christ. Do you know how many times I've tried to talk to them? Don't give up. All right? Don't give up. And I tell you, those of you that have that Dorcas approach, Tabitha, it's hard for them to reject the words that come out of your mouth because of the things you have done with your hands and kindness to them. All right? You sowed the seed with kindness. Amen. All right, bow, bow your heads in prayer as we close. Father, I pray in Jesus' name as we talk about sharing the hope of Christ in us. Lord, would you be with your church family here? Help them, Lord, to see your spirit moving and softening people's hearts, opening up their ears to want to hear some hope in this time of turmoil. Even this week, Lord God, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, help us to be wise, whether it's at work, not to get in trouble with the boss. Help us to be wise. But Lord, we pray that you would play us as an instrument for your glory. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.